podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 430, recorded Thursday, May 19th, 2022, after Steve. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Yes, hello, everybody. Triangulation, which is now kind of an on and off effort, uh, is the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology, spend an hour talking to them. And I, and I couldn't resist uh, resurrecting Triangulation after I read this book. It's called After Steve. You've been hearing a lot about it lately, how Apple became a trillion-dollar company and lost its soul. Our guest is the author Trip Mickle. Was at Wall Street Journal, I think, when he wrote this, now at the New York Times. Trip, welcome to Triangulation. Thanks so much for having me. Good to see yeah. you. Good to see you as well. Did you write that second part and lost its soul, or did uh, some editor come along and say, stick that that's in there? The, nah, nah, that, that's, that's my, my work on there. Um, you know, it, it certainly has become a talking point, but it, it was fully thought out. And I think if people take time and read the book and not judge it by its cover, they'll find that that the book more than backs up the the concept spelled out there on the front of it. I think you have some arrows in your back from <laughs> from this title. I, I wasn't accusing you of anything. Right, 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 right. Fair, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, the uh, the world, writing about Apple is a bit like writing about politics, right? Very I mean, brave. It's a, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's, it can be a divisive world where people yeah. are fairly polarized in terms of their opinions of the company. There are not many companies in the world that, that draw that kind of, um, I don't know, a kind of like emotional reaction when you talk about it. But Apple does. I mean, that's a full credit to what it's built. You knew that going in. You must have, right? I mean, you can't cover technology without understanding that Apple has its fans. Yeah, you, you know it going in, but... You don't fully appreciate it until you until until you until you write that first article that you know that may challenge the company or call, call into question some of its business practices. I I think my first one was on Siri and uh, and some of the flaws in Siri and shortcomings in it you and why didn't love it. <laughs> and uh, and you know it was really an explanation of some of the some of the challenges behind the scenes in terms of um, getting direction and support to to make it kind of uh, be everything that they promised it would be. I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, I believe me. I know I've been covering Apple since the '90s, early '90s. I've watched them come and go and up and down. I met. I remember hanging out with Steve on a weekend uh, right before he went back. Uh, he was at Next. And he was so bitter about Apple, so bitter. In fact, he said, you know, Apple, we had a lead. We were beating Microsoft. And then we just sat on our laurels under Herr Spindler and John Scully and Gil Emilio. And that 10-year lead is gone. This was right around, let's see, this would have been 90, 93 or 94. So this would be right around when Windows uh, 311 came out. And he said, it was over by then. Apple's, had, uh, uh, you know, we'd lost our, uh, we'd lost our, he was really mad and really uh, bitter. But of course, as you, and this, this book begins a little bit with Steve coming back to Apple, but it really is the book that needs to be written because we have plenty of books about Apple under Steve Jobs, both the, the, the first round and then Becoming Steve, which was a great book talking about his transition into the, the new Steve when he came back to Apple. But there hasn't been a lot written after, about what happens after Steve died. And I think this is the book that very much needed to be written because, uh, I don't, I don't think we really knew how difficult this transition was going to be for Tim Cook and Johnny Ive. There were a lot of people, I, I think I probably include myself. I remember after Steve died, I told my dad, sell your Apple stock, it's over. <laughs> I, every Thanksgiving I hear about that because he didn't. <laughs> uh, but I was not alone. Um, and in fact, when, one of the things I got from the book that I was fascinated by is how much both Tim and Johnny were rocked by the loss of, of Steve Jobs, the whole company. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I do spend some time writing about, about Johnny's 
you know, I guess just, dis, you know, despair after Steve's death and Tim's for that matter. I mean, Tim famously almost like, um, you know, almost like a scene from great expectations kind of closed off and sealed off Steve's office and left. So weird. Uh, yeah. And left everything, you know, as it was, including art drawn by his daughter and then would walk in there just to feel Steve Jobs presence. Oh, um, that's how much, that's how much he meant to these people. And, that that wasn't just true for those two who were particularly close to him, but for many others. I yeah. mean, they were, you know, and and I think the thing that gets lost when we think about the grief that occurred is how fast the company was changing at that same time. It, it, it had really hit this inflection point where the iPhone was taking off, and so I remember talking to uh, to one you know really critical. Uh, software engineer who who helped um, develop the user interface for the iPhone, and he he could recall pulling into work not long after Steve's death, and the entire parking lot being totally overrun, and he had to like park, you know, down the road and then make this long walk to the office, and he was like, this place I don't even recognize anymore. Yeah. So you lose the founder, and the place is changing, and that that combination I think was just really really difficult for many people to endure. You interviewed 200 people uh, to do this book, but did you talk to Tim or Johnny? You know, can't get into the sourcing on this, but certainly courted the opinion of Tim okay. and Johnny, okay. uh, uh, you know, and, and the people around them okay. um, to try to make sure that that's reflected in the book. It's pretty clear when you read some of the scenes in the book that, <laughs> I mean, your source becomes pretty clear. <laughs> When, when you know, you, you say that, and I got I got to push back a little bit because okay. uh, you know I, I was watching the I was watching the snippet from the View where they had Jonathan Martin on to talk about this McCarthy uh, audio uh -huh. that, he, that he got, and you know he was just making the point that everybody thinks they know who yeah. provides this audio audio recording, but ultimately it's never who you think it is. You know, I, mean, I don't. I so yeah, I certainly are connected to these things. I but, certainly don't want to get anybody in trouble. Out. <laughs> but uh, I think there are only two people in the room when Johnny Ive observes how beautiful the sunlight is coming through the window, and I'm assuming it wasn't Johnny that told you about that. But that's not important. That was right now. that was that, that you know that, that that was actually in his speech. Oh, okay. Uh, at, at campus. He admitted that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, that was in his speech. At, the speech that was provided at campus um, okay. when Lady Gaga performed uh, to celebrate the opening of Apple Park. Yeah. So, yeah. This is his yeah. Pacific Heights home. Johnny made a lot of money. That was one thing I, I got. Oh, this was at his home yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah he, it was after he left apple and he yeah. was uh, he was snapping yeah. and his assistant comes up with a light lunch and says johnny johnny you've got a call and johnny looks up he's left apple and of course he's got the most i can't imagine this but your description is very good severe room with hardly any color except for the a beautiful bouquet of garden roses and he looks up and he sees the light streaming in from pacific heights and admires the light <laughs> And then, and then you say there are all, there's a handful of people in the world who see more colors than anybody else. His assistant looked at the light, and said, "Yeah, that's nice." <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so. There are a lot of things uh, I want to talk about with this book. It's really it's quite fascinating, and it's it's beautifully written. Uh, as anybody like me who I think I'm more obsessively than most covered every event in in the book you know through the years it's always fascinating to hear what was going you know we see from the outside what's going on but to hear what was going on in the inside and you've got obviously got some very good sources for how apple was thinking what was going on uh, uh so well done very well researched and really uh, everybody i've talked to now who's uh who's read the book agrees this is kind of a must read a uh, book if you're interested in, in apple in the years uh from 2011 to the present uh, but there are a few things I want uh, lots of things I want to ask you about actually sure, sure, um, sure yeah. you do a little biography which is great at the beginning of uh, Tim Cook and his life story which we had not heard a lot about because he's a very private uh, guy uh, same thing with Johnny uh, both of them uh, in their youth not much like the the characters we know today maybe Tim is more like his uh, original self uh, than uh, than Johnny Johnny is uh, and I'm curious what reaction you've gotten from his camp on this, because I'm sure it's an intended to be sympathetic, but he maybe and maybe it's just me, but he comes off as a little bit of a, a kind of an arrogant designer. 
it's, it's possible that you know that's your read and your interpretation. But they didn't. But the sure. but the but you didn't hear from them afterwards. <laughs> no, I haven't, no. I, haven't heard, I haven't heard any criticism okay. of it. I mean, I, I you know I uh, maybe it's accurate. I'm sure, maybe. people. I'm sure people who are close to Johnny would probably look at that and say, well, you know, if you he's brilliant. If you have such a dis distinct way of seeing the world, and yeah. you know, you yeah. you have confidence about how something should be designed or made, then um, then uh, arrogance you know, maybe just part of the process. I mean, we have, um, you know, culturally, I think, do we make different allowances for people right. who are who are artistically minded? Um, you can see that in, you know, in music or, or art or anything else. And certainly no one would say Steve Jobs is less than arrogant. Uh, they made a very good team, in fact, and you point this out in the book. Uh, they were uh, kind of like soup and sandwich. They were, they, they were a perfect pair. And, and, and there's a great image in it uh, where I thought of football where Steve is running interference for Johnny as so that Johnny can freely run down the field and design the iPhone or the Apple Watch or the Bondi Blue iMac. And Steve's just getting people out of the way, getting the no-sayers out of the way and saying, no, this is how we're going to do it. Um, you talk about the handle on the original round Bondi Blue iMac that Johnny knew was going to cost a lot of money to go back and retool it, put a handle on it. And he knew at any other company... They'd say, well, you can't do that. <laughs> and, and Steve said, no, that's a great idea. Let's do it. He signed off on it. Uh, but that's partly the tragedy of this, is that after Steve, uh, Johnny did not have that support from Tim Cook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Tim Cook um, was, you know, he was, front, he, he was on the outside of, of the creative circle that was at the heart of the company, right? And he was worried about, about the operations aspect of, of what was going on at Apple. And it's just uh, so, you know, as skilled as Johnny is at um, fashioning a design or sketching or drafting, Tim is equally skilled with numbers. And that's, that's his, his world that he's comfortable in. He's, he's far more comfortable in the grids of a spreadsheet than he is you know, sitting around subjectively weighing in on how a corner or a, of an iPhone is rounded. And so he just, he did not make a major effort to spend a lot of time in the design studio. Um, that place was not a place that felt familiar or comfortable to him. It's easy at any point in the game to say, oh, Tim made a mistake. But when you look back at what he's, you know, Apple's net worth and the success of their products and their their vast success, it's hard to find fault with anything Tim Cook has done. Mm -hmm. um, but right. he did lose Johnny Ive. That's maybe the one thing you might find fault with. D yeah. Did he, you know, did he lose Johnny Ive or was that an inevitability uh, at a company where you, you know, that became increasingly unfamiliar to Johnny? Right. Um, right. You know, um, a place that was bigger and not as nimble and where uh, there's a, there's a nugget in the book where, you know, even shortly after Steve had died, um, where Johnny had an idea for making a change to a product, and it was two weeks too late because they had to line everything up to get um, a product out at a certain time, and you just couldn't you couldn't uh, have the flexibility in the calendar to arrive at an idea. It would have to lie dormant for a whole year, and by then it might not even be worth worth pursuing. Right. Uh Actually, Johnny talked Steve Jobs down a moment like that when the first Bondi Blue iMac came out and it had a door that slid out. Steve had thought there was going to be a slot. And Johnny said, that's next year. That's next year. It's going to be okay. And Steve said, oh, okay. But he was furious until Johnny talked right. him down. They were quite a quite a pair. Yeah, that was, that was a really... Uh, I don't an illuminating anecdote to hear about because it seemed to really underscore the the relationship that they had where you have you know Steve Jobs who's so vol voluble and so prone to <laughs> prone to, to to yelling and screaming at colleagues and Johnny who's who's relatively quiet and reserved he he can yell as well but he had a way of being a calming presence for yeah. Steve and and putting him at ease um in moments of volatility um You talk uh, a little bit about uh, this is it's interesting because I get I, I hate to say that Tim Cook didn't have Johnny's back because you talk about a an event that kind of I had not heard about that stunned me uh, when the Apple Watch first came out. Many of us remember this event. It was held at uh, De Anza College, a kind of ugly 
Community College in San Jose. Historic, because that's where the Macintosh had been rolled out and so forth. Uh, but, but Johnny, who, who was really thinking of the Apple Watch as a fashion device, not, not anything it's become since, uh, the health device or anything, but as a, a fashion device, um, thought, I can't bring all the fashion press. I can't bring Anna Wintour out <laughs> to see the, uh, her first view of the Apple Watch in De Anza College. So they're in a meeting, and Johnny says, well, what if we build a tent out front, and we could make something nice where they could show off the watch? And somebody says, well, there's, there's trees there. We, we can remove the trees, uh, build the tent, replace the trees afterwards, but it's going to cost $25 million. And you describe Tim Cook just quietly sitting there during this conversation. I can only imagine him gulping $25 million for a tent. But Johnny says, let's do it. And Tim backs him. Tim says, okay, let's build a <laughs> one time only and boy, did that, if you see the tent, holy cow! It was no, it wasn't a wedding tent. It was a beautiful two-story uh, edifice that Johnny designed and built. And then they, I guess they put the trees back afterwards. Right, right. They even went so far as to have some, some, some people from the fashion world do all the lighting for the interior, so the 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 lights when they hit the Apple watches that were laid out and in, inside the interior of the tent, you know, were were um, were almost you know, the quality of what you would see on a runway. That's really a lot of what I got from this is how much the attention to detail. Steve, we knew Steve had this. I have a, we have a friend, Alex Lindsay, who says uh, if he's ever looking for the right T-shirt brand, he'll just go down to the Apple campus because Steve was always making sure that the T-shirts were the best T-shirts you could get. So you want to always find out what Steve picked because that's the best. You talk a little bit about Steve Jobs' plane that he designed in this leather and Steve didn't want shiny buttons, so he had brushed aluminum buttons. And uh, I think Johnny bought the plane right after Steve yeah, passed. Yeah, Johnny, yeah, it became yeah, his plane. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, you know the beautiful leather seats. Um, there's so much attention to detail that I missed when you go to the Steve Jobs uh, Theater at the campus. Each one of those seats, you talk about they're using Ferrari leather. Each one of those seats cost fourteen thousand dollars. In in you know, for the unwashed press to sit in while Apple's revealing a new product. And again, that's, that's, uh, that's Johnny Ive. And so as much as he, Steve ran interference, it sounds like Johnny for a long time did kind of get his way. Yeah. 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 There was, he was still given a, a long leash and given an opportunity. I think the difference that, that, occurred in, uh, in the wake of Steve Jobs' death was that this became much more of a leadership by committee, mm -hmm. uh, much more consensus driven. Mm -hmm. And that meant that for somebody like Johnny, who didn't particularly enjoy or uh, and had some disdain for, for conflict and, and debate, all of a sudden he was thrust in a world where that was, that was what you had to do. Right. Um, so uh, the great example of this was when they went to try to decide whether or not they were going to do the Apple Watch. And Johnny helped organize a big meeting for all the senior and top executives um, to go over what the watch could be. And it was really understood going to that meeting, which was at a hotel here in, in New York, that this was Johnny's show and he was trying to persuade his, his peers that uh, this was the right direction for the company to go in. We're talking to Trip Mickle. He's the author of a brand new book, After Steve, How Apple Became a Trillion Dollar Company, Two Trillion Dollar Company, maybe three trillion soon, and right. lost its soul. Actually, not soon. <laughs> tr 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 trillion's quite flexible. <laughs> yeah, you know? like, they're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're they, sub they, two trillion now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what a, a great read. Highly recommended. It's available uh, on Audible. It's available at Amazon and bookstores from William Morrow. Uh, There's a special triangulation convened because this book is so good and so important, I think, um, to talk about. The, the excerpt I read, uh, and many of us read in the New York Times, Johnny said, the accountants have taken over. The accountants have taken over. Um, he, didn't, he didn't like the, we would, others might call them bean counters. Right. And yet right. he really did get away with, I mean, he was able to do a lot of stuff that I would have, I would have, any bean counter might have said, 25 million, remove the trees. Can we just uh, put it in the back? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, but he eventually, he eventually, I think, uh, drifted off you talk about um mm -hmm. 
a meeting where uh, the designers brought him a product. He kind of, even though he's, uh, you know, maybe the big mistake was Tim Cook making him, putting him in charge of all software after Scott Forstall left, was fired. That's a great scene, too. We'll get to that. But after Scott Forstall was fired, uh, Johnny got basically everything. You're in charge of everything, Johnny. And that was too much for him. He didn't want to be a manager. He wanted to be the designer. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, he said as much when he spoke to Stephen Fry uh, when when he he went to he he reached an agreement around 2015 to go part time uh, at Apple, and Stephen Fry came out to talk to him about that. He was you know Johnny was being named ch you know chief design officer at that at that point, and um, and was basically elated to no longer have to deal with the bureaucracy and the managerial resp responsibilities that he'd had the previous several years. He wanted the power because he didn't want anybody to say no. He just didn't want the responsibility of, of having to say yes or no to a bunch of stuff he didn't care about. So at one point, uh, he would make the designers come up to his club in San Francisco. And at one point, he shows up, th what was it, three hours late? And then just kind of looks at it and goes, oh, okay, and then leaves. Uh, totally disconnected was it a gradual process or was there a, a sudden moment where he just kind of lost interest the the watch process which he really drove for the company left him very fatigued and at the tail end of that he is when he 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 felt like he was worn down he went on a couple week vacation he returned and he he eventually approached tim cook and told tim that he wanted to either step away from the company permanently or uh, or sh reach some other arrangement where he didn't have to come into the office all the time. Um, and Tim Cook didn't want to be in the, you know, he, you know, he told people around him that he didn't want to be remembered as the CEO who lost Johnny Ive at that time. This is 2015. There was still, I think, a, a, a deep concern within Apple and a concern that it dogged him in the years right after Steve Jobs' death that he didn't want to lose these really talented executives that Steve Jobs had assembled. And Johnny was, you know, Johnny was uh, at the at the top of that list. Right. So when Johnny made this request, um, Tim Cook reached an agreement that they thought they could live with, which was for Johnny to remain involved in, you know, largely the new product areas. So forward-looking efforts like the Titan Car Project and, and, and Apple Park, which needed to be completed, um, and come in on a part-time basis. But I don't think either one of them anticipated how what the fallout of that would be because this well-oiled machine that had functioned for years with Johnny Ive being in the studio uh, almost every day making assessments of how to tweak and change products as they were being prototyped and pushed forward – all of a sudden, you know, you took the central figure out of it, and that just created wrinkles that no one was prepared for. The watch was, though, the first uh, product after Steve's death that was 100% uh, under Tim Cook and, and really under Johnny Ive. And Johnny brought this on himself, by the way. I think we remember the, the, the charity uh, product red auction that he designed a, a Leica. He and Mark Newsom, his friend, designed a Leica camera for and a... But I think it was a red, there was a red cooler or something and mm -hmm. <laughs> just some, a bunch of stuff. He was working on all these other projects, doing the lobby of Claridge's Hotel uh, for Christmas and just all this other yeah. stuff in addition to spearheading what was going to be the, the most important product uh, coming out of Apple since Steve's death. Yeah, he, he he loaded himself up with a lot of a lot of work responsibilities right after Steve's death, and, and namely those were the software uh, area that he was responsible for pushing the watch. Uh, you mentioned the Leica camera that was designed for Red, and then Apple Park. I mean, those were all things that he was shouldering at the same time. Uh, I think any one of those you could look at and say, "Well, that's a lot, a lot to work on." Less so the charity thing. That was obviously a bit of a sideshow and diversion. But the other stuff. I mean, that's that's a lot of responsibility. He went from managing a you know primarily a team of about twenty designers to dealing with. Um, man manifold number of designers in the software area, and that's that's really complicated if you don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, approving expense reports. The when he left Apple, he has a, he got a hundred million dollar, uh, well, it's golden parachute, but also contract for his company Love From to to consult <laughs> Apple. What's your sense of how involved Johnny and uh, Mark are right now with Apple? They're still involved in, in like an advisory capacity. I think that'd be the best way to describe 
what they're doing. So if, if you know, products are, are continuing to be worked on, they'll come in, weigh in, offer their advice. Who wouldn't want to hear from Johnny Ive if you're right. working or, or Mark Newson if you're working on a product design right. and, uh, and you have two of the best industrial designers in the world at, at you know, at, at your, uh, at your ready if you want, if you want their opinion. So uh, that's primarily the role they're, they're playing there now. Um, but they're not at the forefront of pushing product forward. How much of the team Johnny built at, at Apple Design is still there? Is, is 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 the rest of the team still there? Or did a lot of people leave after he left? They, concurrently with Johnny's departure, so this is shortly before and, and shortly after, I mean, they, that group of 20 lost about, if you include Johnny, about, about seven uh. designers. So they went through a real period of change. Um, this is going to be a kind of a new generation of of names. There are still some longstanding members of the team that are there, but many of the people who are leading the products at this point are are less familiar to everyone. This is the the team he built of 20 or so uh, designers uh, who probably most of us don't know by name, but we, we really know their work. It was a really well-oiled machine, it sounds like, at its heyday. Yeah, well-oiled and just incredibly collegial as well. Yeah. These people, they, they, were, they were friends. I mean, they have close bonds and th those close bonds will continue whether they're working together every day or not. Yeah. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about Tim Cook. You kind of alluded to that. He was, after Steve uh, passed, he was very sad. Um, Steve told him, don't ask what would I do. Do what, you know, you want to do very famously. Uh, but I think he definitely felt the shadow of Steve looking over him. And he was, I think, I, the picture I get from your book is desperate not to uh, disappoint, but, but to live up to uh, the company that Steve had built. I think he and Johnny both felt that way, that they really wanted Apple to continue on uh, in the spirit of Steve Jobs. That's a hard thing to do, though. Yeah, no, absolutely. Especially if you know that your skill set is radically different from yeah. your predecessors, right? Nobody's like, nobody could could take could fill his shoes. I mean, Steve was a unique, difficult in many ways, but a unique person who brought those products to life. Um, the Apple Watch has been a success, but Johnny did not really understand what it was going to become. It didn't succeed right away. I remember very well when I got the first one saying, I don't know why what you really need with this. Uh, uh, it was a fat, and then, you know, there was a $18,000 solid gold one. That that just didn't fit Apple's. Uh, it almost felt like if Steve had been around, he would have he would have stopped some of these excesses of of Johnny Ive, and maybe he would have seen what Tim Cook and and the team eventually did see, which was that it wasn't a it was fa it was fashion. Yes, I mean I have to thank Johnny because I have a hundred different watch bands, and it was Johnny Ive's idea to take this you know simple looking device and give it some customization with the watch band. Thank you, Johnny. But it was really Tim and, and his team who realized it's a health device. And that's where it has succeeded wildly. Not because yeah. of Johnny, but because of, of Tim and company. It's interesting. If you talk to people who worked on that project, um, who, who are less, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the best term. They, they're not picking sides in this whole thing, right? They're not saying that it is fashion or it is fitness. They'll say to a person that um, that the fashion focus was right, but overdone. Yeah, that's and the right. reason. Yeah. The, the reason the, the reason they say that is because if that watch had come out and Apple hadn't won over the fashion right. community, they would have risked having it dismissed. It would have just and, been another Fitbit. And, yeah, and, and unacceptable at all, right? And instead yeah. now you can go to the nicest restaurant in New York and see people with that on Everybody's their Everybody's wearing it. Right, right. And that's not because they're all running marathons no. or because they're swimming laps in the right. pool in the morning. That's because it was made acceptable uh, in yes. the eyes of the fashion community. It's a good point. Yeah, uh, it certainly has taken off. So Tim has some skills that are really, uh, have been very useful in the in, in the intervening years, his ability to, to weave in and out of politics, to bring China into the fold, to handle uh, President Trump, uh, which must have been a, a, a teeth gritting challenge for Tim. Uh, he's done, I think, in many ways, a good job. And certainly the financials are show it. In fact, I think some people make the case that uh, after Johnny left, Apple kind of got its mojo back with the Macintosh, finally designing a good keyboard 
uh, making a machine that was that where the function was more important than the form. And I think that a lot of people, I, I include myself, felt like form had trumped function under Johnny Ive to some degree. Uh, and Tim has taken it, and he's and I think where Tim has done well is he's he knows he's not the he's not a Steve Jobs, he's not a Johnny Ive, he's not a creative type, but he's done well in finding the right people to fill those roles. Um, right. Is right. that your I think sense? Johnny Shrewdry, yeah, I think Johnny Shrewdry is a great example Brilliant. of that. I mean, one yeah. of the, one of the one of the interesting things, and when you look back at the history of Apple, is that it, the the company is really its success has been the product of pairs. You know, you had Jobs and Waz at the outset, and then you had Jobs return and team up with Johnny for this decade run that was kind of like, uh, you know, building Camelot and Cupertino. And then Johnny and Tim have been in less close probably uh, than, than, the, uh, than, than their predecessors on a personal level, but equally important from uh, a partnership in terms of pushing the company forward with Tim focused on services and Johnny focused on, on the watch. I think it's an open question of who that partner is for Tim going forward. You know, who does he balance himself out with? And maybe just as Jobs had his Johnny, Tim Cook's found found his Johnny and Johnny Shruji. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to enter a period that is more chip-driven development. Certainly we're seeing that with the, the resurgence of the Mac as a consequence of the M1 chip. It's remarkable. And it's all about engineering, not about design at all, uh, which it tells you something. Right. And in some ways you can think about that and think like, well, in a way that makes sense, right? I mean, you can put numbers on a board and say, you're seeing this amount of improvement in terms of battery performance or, uh, or processing speed with a chip with, uh, you know, a curved corner. That's, that's a really sub subjective thing to say like, yes, but you know, this is, this is why that's important. And this is what that does uh, for the product and why people will buy it. Well, and J uh, Tim's supply chain expertise has really proven hugely important to Apple, where every other company is, is desperate for chips. Apple has sewn up the production of TSMC and, and, and is not, I mean, they're still, they're still suffering from supply chain shortages, but I can only imagine what it had been like had Tim Cook not been there uh, uh, spearheading Oh. Their relationship. Tim Cook. If Tim Cook wasn't there, we wouldn't be talking about Apple right now. I think not. Even 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 if the iMac had been a success, they would have left sales uh, sales on the on yeah. the on the table. They, they, they wouldn't have been able to ship enough product to fulfill the demand that that Steve and Johnny created with that product. There was a big surprise in the book, and I had not heard this before. Um, at one point, the engineers uh, go to Tim Cook and say. Uh, look, Tesla's doing all this interesting stuff. You guys don't have uh, anything nearly as interesting. We want to do a car. And if you don't do a car, we're leaving. And uh, Tim Cook exceeded. I don't think anybody knew that the, the t Project Titan, the car project, came from the engineers, not management. Yeah, I mean, that's it speaks to what is a real historically a driving force inside Apple. And that is getting an opportunity to work on and build the next thing. You know, um, I mean, the, the, the people who got pulled off of the iPod and got to work on the iPhone are still legendary at Apple. They, they were the cool kids on campus. And everybody wants to be the cool kid on campus working on the next great product that Apple's gonna launch because that will be something they'll remember for the rest of their lives. And when the watch was finished, everybody looked around and said, well, what's next? And there was, there was some frustration that nothing had been settled on yet. And there was this push from, from engineers on campus to, to push forward with a car project. That was what they had some ambition for doing. And that's really the, the starting point for the Titan effort. Although it is interesting, and I think you can see this by the number of executives who've departed, uh, there's been a lot of turnover with Titan, that without a strong Steve Jobs or Johnny Ive type at the top, uh, I mean, they've got Lynch now, but I, I think you need somebody like that uh, to express the vision. And I, I honestly feel like this is a boondoggle for Apple, to, to be fair, that, that they, they give it, gave in to the engineers who wanted this, but they didn't have a, an overarching vision for it. Right, and there was political conflict and tension in terms of, of what it should be between the engineers, primarily uh, the perspective of Dan Riccio, who who envisioned creating something that would be 
an electric vehicle that could disrupt Tesla, much like the, uh, the iPhone disrupted BlackBerry or Nokia at the time. Uh, and then Johnny Ive, who really had some ambition of creating a fully autonomous vehicle that could show f- chauffeur people around and get them from place to place. And it sounds laughable right now because we're, we're thinking, well, like that's never going to happen. <laughs> but, in tw- but in 2015, there was this, sure. that was, that was in vogue in Silicon Valley, right? Yeah, everybody everybody thought it. that we would be chauffeured, yeah. you know, all, I mean, the Lyft, the, the president of Lyft was saying that by 2021 or 2019, I believe that we would all have, Driverless cars. So was Elon. Taking us place yeah, to place. Yeah. yeah. And Elon's still saying it, right? Still saying um, it every year. <laughs> like Clockwork. It'll be next year. Yeah, I think so. Johnny just wanted to design a really nice living room on wheels. I think some of this was his design. Like he wanted to design this thing. But wouldn't wouldn't a nice living room on wheels be kind of like a great way it. to get around? I'd love yeah. it. If yeah. if so is it, we'd all be living van life, you know. But that's but see that <laughs> down by the river. That's why uh, you need a uh, technologist as well who can say, uh, okay, nice idea, but that ain't going to happen. Although I have to say, and and there's plenty of stories in the book like this where, you know. The first Apple Watch, I love the scene where you described, they brought out basically iPod Nanos and said, you know, <laughs> and, and Johnny says, well, I don't want it so tight on my wrist. And the engineers are going, well, I don't think the heart rate's going to work if you don't have it right on the wrist like that. And I mean, you know, and now in six months, you have to take that iPod Nano and turn it into a little watch that we can sell. There are dozens of engineering challenges in this book and in the history of Apple where people just said that's never going to happen. And Apple... Um, particularly under Steve, but someone under Johnny, I think, as well, made it happen. And that's, to some degree, the secret of their success was they made it happen. Doing the impossible has been fundamental to yeah. their business and their business success, yeah. right? And and I know you, you know, we both laugh about like uh, the absurdity of driverless cars because we haven't seen that yet. But dreaming like that and and coming up with the impossible is kind of the first step to then setting the benchmark that engineers try to work yeah. to meet and that the designers try to work to meet. Everybody's kind of everybody's working together to uh, overcome those hurdles. But you have to have huge ambition um, to to get ahead of your competitors and deliver something that, uh, or deliver a product or a technological leap that is unexpected for the marketplace. This is somewhat in the timeline after uh, the book, but when Kevin Lynch came over from Adobe and then he ran the watch and was able to get the health thing to take off and now he's in charge of Project Titan. And it feels like you were saying, who is going to be that partner for, for Tim Cook? And it feels like that might be... Uh, one of them anyway when it comes to the car that that's apple saying look we're gonna we got to put our best guy in there and i think that right now that's who they feel is is one of their best guys yeah one, one of their best guys but what, what we're seeing are a multitude of best guys right <laughs> so you've got you've got you've got mike rockwell doing the work on uh on ar as well and right. some of that's been a passion project for him and and trying Who's- to push that project forward uh almost independently in a way so um, yeah, yeah. Of course, hopefully Tim Kevin Lynch doesn't have the same situation that occurred with like everyone else who's been in that position. Yeah, and they've all they, left. They, yeah, they've all left. Right. Yeah. Um, he's been a longstanding contributor at Apple. So you wouldn't want to lose somebody like mm-hmm. that. But um, but that seat has not been one that people want to stay in very long. It seems Tim Cook is big in on AR. I mean, Tim is a champion of that. Yes. Is that your sense? Yes. Um, but he's also a champion of autonomy. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Uh, you know, I think, I think he takes direction from the people who know the technology and, and the product development process better than himself. A couple of other uh, surprises, behind the scenes surprises. Uh, it's fun for me because, again, I've lived through this whole chapter, but don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I was stunned when Apple announced it was going to pay $3.2 billion to buy Beats. I thought, this is the stupidest <laughs> thing I have ever heard. Uh, you talk about the, the negotiations with Dre and Iovine, and uh, you, you mentioned, and I hadn't seen this before, uh, Dre kind of screwed it up by saying, yeah. here comes Rap's first billionaire. Apple had very, as you know, is very strict about secrecy and uh, had very strict rules about nobody's going to mention that we're talking about this at all. But meanwhile, Dre... Uh, uh, blows this cover 
He's called up to, in, to along with Jimmy Iovine to, to meet with Tim Cook. I can imagine like going to the principal's office. Uh, Iovine knows we got we got a problem here, and Tim Cook uses it to negotiate the price down by two hundred million dollars. Yeah, yeah, and the understanding with within uh, you know the world of Beats and and the people that work there was that Dre took a haircut because. You know, Whoops. was was not in fact the first billionaire of Compton, as as he proclaimed Whoops. so famously on Facebook. Whoops. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, and I didn't know. I I guess no, I don't think I did know this. Apple had already been working on a streaming music system. See, what we were trying to figure out: did they buy it for the headphones? Is really is that Apple think that a headphone business is worth three point two billion, or did they buy it because they wanted to do streaming music? And Apple historically was way behind. So you point out Spotify was kicking their butts. Uh, Apple, which had been dominant, was the number one music store when you bought music, had completely lost the thread when streaming became the thing. Uh, it turns out they had been working on their own in-house streaming project. Uh, and when the, when the Beats guys came in, because Beats had a streaming music service, they, they thought they were the, you know, the, the golden boys come to save Apple. And now you've got two competing products and they had to kind of duke it out. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I you know, the ambition was to create the music service. Of course, the Beats beat staff come in, as you noted, and uh, and discover. Wait, Apple's already at work on this. What? We had we had no idea, and 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 as a result, they had to fuse together these two different products, and that was not easy because, as you'll recall, the Beats culture and the Beats identity was very different from Apple. I mean, you know, Jimmy Iovine and Tim Cook are pretty different figures, and. Uh, and and Beats was built in Jimmy's image, yeah, while yeah. Apple had the discipline of of Tim Cook um, fully in 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 play by that point in time. Um, and you know, some of this was most evident, and some of the tension around this was most evident in some of the the design vision for how uh, Beats Beats music would then become Apple music. They what looked it very look different. Like. iTunes yeah. and Beats were completely different. But the 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 team from Apple favored a more iTunes looking experience and the team from Beats favored a more Beats looking experience, which was a bit more of what we've seen Apple Music become, right. um, you know, large, large album art and you know, scrolling through songs and so on and so forth. And um, it really took Eddie Q weighing in and looking at and assessing the two different proposals as the book details. And and looking at them and going, well, this one obviously looks better. Why would we do the other one? But <laughs> that that other kind of Apple driven idea was in at the forefront because the people at Apple had more power as right. this as this process was was unfolding. As it turns out, it didn't matter because if you could put it on a billion phones and a billion pockets, you're going to win no matter what. And and Apple's uh, music was and is a huge success uh, out of the box, mm -hmm. even if it yeah, wasn't as good as Spotify. Yeah, I think, and I think that speaks to you know one of the interesting areas that Tim Cook got involved in when it came to the Apple Music development process, and it was it was their ambitions in terms of sales, how many subscribers they would sign up, and there was a, a meeting that the marketing team from Apple Music came into, and they said, oh, we think we can go from a hundred thousand, this is, these are people from Beats, a hundred thousand subscribers to ten million, which they thought was a huge leap, and Tim just kind of sat back and said. Is that the best you can do? Um, <laughs> and by the time they walked out of the meeting, they realized they'd had to double their numbers to 20 million, which they thought was insane. Um, but, it's, you know, and then the product comes out and of course it faces a bit of uh, criti critical blowback from tech reviewers. And lo and behold, within a year, they've hit their numbers. Yeah. Um, because Tim Cook just intuitively understood the power of how how deep the iPhone's reach was by that point in time. Yeah. If you own the platform, you can do a lot of things. Um, which reminds me of uh, Apple TV Plus. You talk about the the big rollout um, uh, with Oprah. They really wanted Oprah mm -hmm. to come back out of retirement for them. Um, that has proven to be a little bit more difficult to, to uh, succeed. But Apple has an advantage. They don't have to make music on, uh, make money on music or TV uh, yeah. because they have Apple One and they have services and they just, it's a value add. So they're in a very, they're kind of now with the trouble that Netflix is having, I think they're sitting in the catbird seat. So that may also end up being a, 
a, yeah, a, yeah. It's it's interesting um, when you look at uh, some of Apple's good fortune over the past decade. I think the the foremost example of that is Samsung and what happened uh, to Samsung with its <laughs> Galaxy <laughs> Galaxy phones exploding. Right, <laughs> this was at a time where Apple. They were, were, they were scared. They were really scared. scared. Yeah, it was. It was. It was not in their mind going to be the best iPhone cycle. And Samsung was still really challenging and pressing them at this point. And they were going into. I think that was the iPhone Seven, if I'm, I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah, they had just and, done the six when the Note Seven came out and blew yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, and so and 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 so they lo and behold that that phone wound up being a much, much more popular yeah. phone than they thought yeah. it would be. And yeah. Tim Cook, who's famously so exacting when it comes to projecting how much inventory they'll need, missed, missed his numbers. And that was a combination of Sam, Samsung literally exploding and then also, uh, you know, not fully appreciating the power of that, that portrait feature on the camera and how right. popular that would be. Right, yeah, Samsung had iris recognition. So they thought, oh, this face recognition that we're, you know, working on isn't going to be a big deal because again scooped by samsung it's funny because of course a a apple sued samsung for ripping off everything they did but in the long run it was samsung who led the way to big phones and and proved that there was a market for a big phone with a note and apple followed mm -hmm. suit with a six six s plus and bigger and bigger and bigger phones and they have even the, and today the small phones don't are <laughs> kind of flops they can't mm -hmm. they can't yeah. sell them yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 They're sc they're scaling back their mini right. their mini ambitions right. all right. because it's not not as popular as even people who are vocal about it would assume it would be. Yeah. Uh, so are you going to continue covering Apple, or are you, if you had it, are you? Are you yeah. <laughs> no. I you know I I, I I recently joined the New York Times about a month ago, and I'll be covering Apple for for the Times now. Are so, you, um, I, this is about after about a year of covering Google. So I spent, I spent some time covering Google as well. I think you're uh, better off. What the, what, uh, we're trying to figure out what the hell's going on with Google. They, they've lost their mojo. It feels like, well, have they, I mean, they have a, they have possibly the most lucrative and that's best the business ever created. That's uh, the problem. Know, they, they don't have to do what, anything. They've got search and ads. Yeah, search search is just you know it's a license to print money. Right. So I think that it's, it's interesting. It, it, that's what Apple doesn't have. They're always on the edge. They had the the iPhone could have done that to them actually, uh, because it's so successful. But I think they understand that you know it's fifty two percent uh, this quarter of their revenue that it, they need it to be less and less and less, and they need something else. They need the next new thing. Google feels yeah. like they're just throwing stuff on the, against the wall, and they get tired of stuff, and they don't. it doesn't matter because they've got search and search ads, and it doesn't, right. the rest of it doesn't matter. Right. They need to com try to compete in the hardware space yeah. so that they don't fully have to subsist on the back of like Amazon, let's say if the Echo had become even bigger, right? I mean, right. that Google Assistant would have been squeezed out of that marketplace. Um, so they rushed into Google Home, rushed out Google Home just to be sure they they were competing in that world. But um, but they've never found their footing from a right. hardware perspective. Um, that's why they pay Apple so much for default search position. Even, even though for iPhone. some reason, Tim Cook can't seem to remember just how much. Yeah. Some amount. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, you talk about this when uh, Amazon came out with the Echo. Apple was stunned. They thought these guys—they're just—they're uh, just, you know, it's Walmart online. What? Are, what? Are, they don't have any hardware, and so they were not ready for the success of the Echo at all. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I was talking to somebody with from Google this week, and they had the same reaction. You know, I think Amazon just caught everybody by surprise. Um, they just did not anticipate that they'd be able to do that. That's and, why. And it, and it and it particularly chafed some people at Apple because some of the engineering talent that was working on the Echo had spent time at Apple. So Apple had a chance, or you know, the ability to do some of the um, some of the microphone technology that was core to the Echo and let let some of that expertise walk out the door. You spend a lot of time talking about uh, the uh, uh, locked iPhone and the terrorists, the San Bernardino terrorists, and Apple's stance and the fight back and forth is a very interesting era. Um, do, you, do you credit Apple's uh, assertions that they're 
protecting our privacy. Do you think they really do care about that? Is it a marketing term for them or? It's, it's both. It's both. I mean, it's, it's, and it's all relative, right? I mean, when you're, when your peers are companies like Google and Facebook, which are built on the back of advertising, you can draw a pretty sharp contrast when your business model is different. Um, I don't think Apple's insincere when it says it's committed to privacy, but I do think there are holes in its commitment and it's aware of those. I mean, the, the great example would be just the fact that if you back up to the iCloud, uh, those, those encrypted messages that you have on your phone, as Paul Manafort discovered, aren't That's quite right. as protected as you would think. That's right. When I saw that Paul Manafort indictment, that was kind of like an eye opener. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, they got all, they got all his WhatsApp messages, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that was Tim Cook's defense kind of secretly. They didn't want to do this in public, but that was kind of the defense with the FBI. Well, look, you know, we give you access to everything in the cloud. If, if you know, that's your fault. You, you blew it. Um, I do hope they, you know, especially in the, f in the face of uh, this week's EU decision uh, or proposal to start um, scanning all messages for CSAM, I hope Apple holds the line. Do you, did you cover, you don't cover it in the book, but do you cover Apple's uh, misguided attempt to put CSAM into the iPhone? CSAM I have not. I was, I was, I was you on the Google, Google on that one. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. During that time but Don't period, worry, you're going to get more, it. you're going to get more opportunities. <laughs> I have a feeling. I don't think it's over sure. uh, by any means, but that's kind of what the EU is proposing is that kind of CSAM detection, but worse, they want uh, all messages to be uh, scanned for grooming material, which is I think almost impossible to do. Uh, I think this this is not going to end. This battle over encryption is just getting started now. And Apple, uh, I would love to see Apple continue to hold the line on this. Uh, you do point out, though, that Tim Cook uh, has a balancing act with China, which is a huge part of Apple's revenue at this point and very important to keeping Apple's uh, business going. And so they right. kind of have to go along with what the CCP asks. Yeah, it's not even just that it's a, uh, China is a huge part of their revenue, but it's that uh, they still make, as we're seeing right now with MacBook shipment time slipping, yeah. they still make most of their products right. there. And if uh, if China were to wake up one morning and say, well, you can't export anything, Apple would have like, I don't know, maybe not zero sales, but, but a lot less than the $360 billion they record on an annual basis. Your sense, having written this book and covering Tim, he's smart enough to be planning for this, right? He knows that's on the horizon. Or potential. Yes, they're they're aware of and have been encouraged to diversify yeah. out of China in terms of their supply chain, and we're right. seeing that. Uh, yeah. You know, they've they've shifted some production to Vietnam and every and everything else, but the number of workers that they need for the iPhone and the fact that they change the iPhone every year. Um, mostly, you know, I mean, every, I guess it's every two years, really, it goes through major, major changes, means that they need that, um, that workforce that they've trained and, uh, and developed over the past two decades. The book is after Steve, it really is the book we needed, because it really talks not so much about Steve Jobs, but about Tim Cook and Johnny Ive, there's a lot of Steve in here too, though, but and how they reacted to Steve's death, and how the directions they took Apple uh, in in the intervening decade. How Apple became a trillion dollar company and lost its soul. I'm still going to quibble on that. I don't. <laughs> yeah, well, you, do you want to talk about it or you just want to quibble? <laughs> <laughs> Did they lose their soul? I mean, if you think about it this way, um, and then this, this is what, I, what my reference to is there. I mean, Johnny Ive was, was Steve Jobs, the longtime creative partner, right? His, his spiritual soulmate in a way. Yes. And he walked out, out of the building in 2019. So in a way, he was representative of this of, of Apple Soul, and then on a on a on a metaphorical level, he was really disillusioned with how the company had shifted from, in his experience, being a place where art dictated commerce to one where commerce increasingly dictated art. Um, and that's that's a change that I think, you know, is one that you don't readily see in the financial figures. But it is one that people who work there have experienced, um, and you know, it's changed the, the way their their day to day experience is at Apple. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, there are not a lot of companies that you would say are soulful. Uh, it's certainly not a prerequisite for economic success. Uh, and in fact, I think you can make the argument that in some ways Johnny uh, did some things that were you know artistic, but not necessarily good for Apple as a as a company. Um, 
So maybe losing your soul isn't the worst thing in the world. Johnny Cerucci right. seems pretty soulful. I bet he can right. get down. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, <laughs> you re, you, your soul can be reborn, right? I, uh, I you think you, you raised the really interesting question of who is to Tim Cook what Johnny Ive was to Steve Jobs. Who's going to be that guy? And I think you're right. I mean, you know, you've got Lennon and McCartney. You've got the Beatles right behind you there. Obviously, Lennon and McCartney. You, I think it's not a, uh, unusual in business to have an art, artist and to have a bean counter. And if you confuse those two well, you can really do amazing things. And that's what Steve and Johnny did. Uh, and so that is, a, I think, an important question. You've got a master of business, Tim Cook. There's no question about that. But who's his Johnny Ive? is I guess ultimately the question. So maybe maybe not lost but searching for their their new their new soul. Their I'll new soul. I'll send you the edits on the next book that I write. <laughs> <laughs> no no no. I don't want to edit it. I think this is a perfect book. I highly recommend it. It's hard to put down. It's really great reading. Uh, if you're a close Apple follower, you'll 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 get you'll thrill from all the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, if you haven't been following Apple closely, you may be amazed at the at this story because it is not a clear arrow to the moon it is definitely uh a, a kind of a, a random walk but it has, somehow they've made it and uh and this this chronicles it it's a really good book trip and i'm very pleased that we could talk i as soon as i read the excerpt in the new york times i said i want to get trip on the show uh and now having read the book i'm very very glad uh we did good luck at the new york times we'll be reading you with with great interest and yeah. uh, following your coverage of the fruit. Thanks company. so much for for reviving triangulation. To, to just talk for about you, this. I did it's been it. Fun. Just been for fun. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been a blast. Thanks, I've enjoyed Trip. it. All right. Well, Thanks see so much you soon. for having me. We do right, triangulation we'll uh, off and on when we get somebody great like Trip Mickle to do it. We will also put it just, you don't have to subscribe to the triangulation feed, although that feed still exists. And uh, if you were subscribed to it, here you have a surprise episode. Uh, but we'll also put it on the uh, much more active Twit Events feed and uh, that's where you can get apple events google events uh, announcements of that kind and special events like this so subscribe to one or the other or both that's that's great if you do and we thank you so much for watching we'll see you next time a triangulation bye-bye